Snape, Snape, Severus Snape, Dumbledore, Snape, Snape, Severus Snape, Dumbledore. We are back with Two Christians Watch, Harry Potter. I am Hannah, and that is... Will is here again for another Harry Potter movie. (laughs) Can you get a little closer to your mic? No. I will not get closer to my mic. You cannot make me get closer to my mic. I will get further and further away until I disappear like some kind of spell. Wow. Visibility cloak activate. Uh, So this is the Two Christians Watch podcast. We are under Metamorphic Site Productions. This used to be the Metamorphic Site Productions podcast. We changed the name to Two Christians Watch. And we are two Christians who are now going through the Harry Potter series. We were not Harry Potter kids or Potter heads or I can't... What are they called? Potter heads? In the hands of the Potter. In the hands of the Potter. That's like the... It's a little too (laughs) Christianese. But we uh, did not grow up with it. We missed the boat. Definitely still feel the ramifications of not being a Harry Potter kid in our generation. Like it still comes up even now, like Barnes and Noble still has all the Harry Potter stuff out. There's still drama around it. They're still releasing movies. Um, And so we decided, you know what, let's just, let's just blind react to it as we, we've never done it before. Let's just see what the story where it takes us for the first time. You know, obviously it's, it's heathen devil witchcraft and we just have to ignore that. No, just that's what we were told when we were kids. Are you smiling at me? Mm -hmm. what so is the movie ghosts in the uh timeline as well with the pottery scene in the timeline of harry potter in the same universe because they have a pottery table potter i don't i i think that's a jump to just connect it's a joke not a jump so that is the intro to the podcast um (laughs) that's the intro that's it that's that's all i got sorry uh but we are going to go into a summary of the movie we watched the chamber of secrets which is the second film in the franchise or saga or i don't know what they call it they call the twilight saga saga i don't know what they call the harry potter movies um but this is the second movie um and i'll throw it over to will and let him uh summarize what we watched what did we watch will (laughs) i would say previously in harry potter but as we'll get to later it's pretty much a beat for beat uh comparison to the first one and it's pretty one-to-one um so we start off potter is home for the summer and same as usual his family is verbally abusive to him and he is uh trapped in his room for hours on end with very little food or sunshine or friends and the he has a room now though he does have a well he technically had a room the first time but it was a a proper bedroom not the uh, closet okay um i want to briefly mention the character of doc Dobby, um, not the cool character Dobby from My Hero Academia. We're talking Dobby the house elf, which is about three foot tall and is intentionally problematic. He's constantly trying to cause more problems for Harry, uh, causing him to be uh, blamed for things to keep him from getting to Hogwarts because he says that there is a threat for his life at Hogwarts. And so he's trying to keep Harry away from Hogwarts. Uh, Can I uh, interject? You called him the Jar Jar Binks of uh, Harry Potter. Would you stand by that, that statement still? I stand by it of my own opinion. I'm sure there is some weird fan group that is like that stands Dobby that probably has a relationship for Dobby in the Harry Potter universe. Um, Maybe it's with Moaning Myrtle. We don't know. But what the real thing is, is that this character is insufferable. He is whiny. He, for some reason, uh, becomes masochistic halfway through his little scene where he starts slamming his head against things. It's annoying. Anyways, the Weasleys come to his rescue with a flying car, bail him out, take him to Hogwarts. Well, before they get to Hogwarts, they, he int- he's introduced to the Weasleys and the mother and father of that group. And we find out the father is involved in um, trying to control and contain magic, I guess, in the, in the real world. And so the Weasleys are super nice to him and they're praising Harry. They go back to Diagon Alley. Um, that's where we meet. I'm going to say Lucius Malfoy. I'm not going to pronounce it the way. Lucius. I'm not going to pronounce it like that. It's Lucius Malfoy. Very good actor. I'm excited. Uh, Jason Isaacs, I believe his name is. Yes. A uh, very good actor, very esteemed actor. And he is obviously antagonistic to both the uh, Weasleys and to Harry Potter. Comically so. Well, not yet. I would say it's fir- there. <laughs> at first... Malfoy is very uh, sneaky and, you know, snake-like almost. We'll get to that. Um, And he is very much suspicious movie villain. He is, you know, subtle enough and he's very venomous in his words. They get to Hogwarts and things happen. Basically, things start falling apart for Harry Potter. He keeps getting blamed for things that he's not doing. And now a new threat is on the horizon because students and cats are getting frozen in time, petrified. Uh, It's unclear if they're still in their body 
bodies or not because petrified means completely solid and this an outside force is causing this and they're right there's writing in the wall that is covered in blood that is like messages to harry messages to the school that there is a threat and so of course harry and the gang reunite to go investigate even though it's not their job to do so um all in the span of a school year and sorry to say any students that are petrified at the beginning of the school year will remain petrified until the beginning of summer so if they are out they are out cold for six months nine months whatever that looks like um and so that's a problem but basically once again we get the blame game people are blaming hagrid for the crimes and hagrid's like I, I, not me bro Hogger gets arrested. Um, Dumbledore is kind of like shrugging his shoulders the whole time. He's not really solving any of this. Um, honestly, at, compared to the last movie, the teachers are inept at best and clueless at worst. Um, they're not really being the professional wizards they're supposed to be in solving this you know, crime when their students are threatened. Um, the Potters, Potter and his team are able to piece together that it's something regarding the Slytherin group and that a pure Slytherin will be coming to the school and taking out anybody who is not a a pure blood wizard that the, their genealogy is not um, wizards all the way back. If they've been mixed with regular humans, they are targets for elimination and or death. We learn about mud bloods. We learn about that type of uh, idea ideology mm -hmm. that's in the wizarding world of there's pure blood wizards and then there's mud bloods, which is a bad term for them. Basically, wizards who have muggles in their family line. But Hagrid tells us that it's kind of impossible to have because I think I think the the consensus in the film is that wizards are human. They just have like magical abilities. Mm -hmm. And so it makes no sense for them to be like a different anything. Yeah. So anyways, um, it's just growing problems with the Slytherin group. They find out about the Chamber of Secrets, which was one of the founding members of the school, created this chamber that would house his dark magic that would uh, help him eliminate any of these half-bloods and that in, he would come back, his spirit would come back and eliminate this threat to the, to the purity of the school. They are leaning on the Slytherin group. Basically, the students finally find a way down to the Chamber of Secrets where they are confronted with a giant snake and a person named tom riddle who they oh, thought was did you mention the diary <laughs> not yet who they thought was an ally because they found his diary and the diary led them to the chamber of secrets they thought because the diary gave them a vision of a past where tom riddle was trying to solve this a similar situation with students being petrified they thought that tom riddle was an ally tom riddle became realized it was his the villain and that it was voldemort being using this tom riddle character to try to regain control and regain power so so Voldemort strikes again. They summon a snake, a giant building-sized snake, and uh, Harry Potter is the only one to face the snake alone, and he is powerless. And so what happens is Dumbledore's phoenix somehow gets to this secret hidden lair and flies to him because Harry it, truly believes in Dumbledore. And because of that, the phoenix sensed that, found a way into the secret lair, dropped him the sorting hat from the first movie. The sorting hat begat a sword that can only be used by true through Gryffindors, and then Harry magically knew how to use a sword enough to slay the serpent, cut off one of its teeth, and then the only way to beat Tom Riddle slash Voldemort, possessed by Voldemort, was to destroy the book, which is not revealed and it's just Harry Potter just happens to know that he needs to destroy the diary that's powering Voldemort. And so instead of using the sword, instead of tearing up the book, instead of drowning the book, he stabs it with the tooth he took from the snake and Voldemort is turned to dust again and Harry wins the day. And the last thing we see is uh, Hagrid is, you know, his char charges against him are relieved because they realize he wasn't the threat. It was really Voldemort again. And Dumbledore is relieved that the school is once again safe. And we now have wrapped up the Chamber of Secrets summary as best I can. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Also, Dobby tries multiple times while Harry's at school to get him to leave. Um, and then he, which is revealed at later at the end that Lucius, or sorry, Lucius, Lucius. It's Lucius. <laughs> I know. I have always said Lucius. Um, he is the one who planted Tom Riddle's diary in Ginny's cauldron at Diagon Alley. And that is just thrown at us that Ginny was the one who's well, doing- Well, Ginny is Ginny Weasley, sister of Ron, Ron Weasley. Weasley. And she's a first 
year this year. But she was the one under a trance to be doing all of the writing on the walls and everything like that. And then I also want to say, I think Tom Riddle is Voldemort's like Christian name. Like that is, he was born Tom Riddle, but then he became Voldemort. It's not like a fake person. He, he really was a student at Hogwarts named Tom Riddle. I believe that's true. But we find out that Lucius planted the diary. I, I don't know if he meant to give it to Ginny or if he was trying to give it to Harry. I'm not sure. Um, no, they were all standing there at the same place uh, when he did it. But then, so Harry learns that if Dobby's master presents him with clothes, that he can be freed. And so he put he plants a sock in the diary and Lucius like is like, oh, hold this to Dobby. And he starts like threatening Harry Potter or whatever. And then Harry's like, open it. And he opened it and there was a sock. And so now he's free. And I'm like, he was really betting that Lucius would hand the diary to Dobby in that moment. Like he was really hoping that that would happen because if not, he's just threatening him now. Oh, see, he's really bad at betting that a sock counts as clothing for a Dobby. Yeah, because when he said that, I thought it meant like purposefully, intentionally, the master had to give like clothes meant for Dobby, like not just a human sock, but like clothes that he would wear. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I didn't write it. Um, but Dobby's free. <laughs> Dobby is free now. And I, I, I know he comes up in later movies, so oh he will be back. Okay, so as Will mentioned, this film is like a huge beat for beat. Not like not like everything is repeated, but so many beats are repeated in this movie as in opposed to the first movie. Almost in, a, in the same order as well. Yeah, it's almost like a formula. It's just like a little bit of change has happened. So there's a part in the beginning where uh, Harry gets his glasses broken, like in the first movie, and Hermione repairs them. Um, there's a part where they have to go into the Forbidden Forest and have, a, have an interaction with a mystical creature, which is... Spiders. But also Aragog, which sounds very close to Aragorn, but is also, I believe, inspired by, oh, what was the spider's name in Lord of the Rings? Shelob. Shelob. Now, I don't believe that Shelob talked. Did she talk? She talks in The Hobbit, I believe. Oh, okay. But in the book. I don't know if she talks in the movie, but if I remember correctly, there's dialogue in the book. So she can like speak to humans or m hobbits or whatever. Okay, so because Aragog can speak to Harry and Ron, they go and see him and learn from Aragog, who was raised by Hagrid, that Hagrid was not the perpetrator of the... So we learned the Chamber of Secrets had been opened like 50 years prior and Hagrid got blamed for it by Tom Riddle. Really, it was Tom Riddle who opened it and they go to see Aragog. But still, they had to go into a forest. They had to go into the Forbidden Forest, the same place they met the Centaur and the Unicorn Blood and see a mystical creature and learn about um, the plot a little bit from that that person one of the teachers is false we didn't even talk about lockhart in this one he's the new defense against the dark arts teacher who that would they put they they um replaced him with quirrell who was killed in the last movie so he took his job gilderoy lockhart played by kenneth brana not a real he's a charlatan pretty much like he just is a fake uh, big phony um but that is still the same professor of the same defense against dark arts now he wasn't in cahoots with voldemort this time but he was uh you know something about him was false yeah so he made himself out that he was this masterful expert in wizardry and he almost knew zero and he was all a bunch of fake stories that he made up to make himself popular so he became one of the most popular wizards by lying um and so once again a teacher is not who they say they are and meanwhile another teacher gets blamed that's not to blame and so last movie it was snape this movie it's hogrid he's not a teacher he's the groundskeeper oh. but i do wasn't there a teacher that they were like suspicious of was it snape this time no snape barely had any yeah, role in he this only film. came in like once um was there another teacher they were like iffy about no okay so i guess i i thought haggard was a teacher but he's the groundskeeper oh they kind of blame dumbledore they tried to get him kicked out well they said that he's inept that he wasn't doing his job fully it wasn't like he was at fault it was just much as this is the second time in two school years that something massive has happened that involves students yeah <laughs> they did not a great track record um also we found out dumbledore is exceptional old because I don't know how old he is but 50 years prior he looked exactly the same he was a professor he's not the headmaster but he was old then so he had to be what do you think like maybe 200 like he is probably well past mm -hmm. yeah um but basically it's it's definitely it feels like they they didn't do a whole lot I mean I don't know how the books are but it doesn't feel like they did a whole lot to make one movie feel different than the other yeah I mean both I mean last movie they felt faced the Cerberus this time they face a giant snake yeah I just thought about this they face Voldemort Harry faces Voldemort at the bottom of the below, castle of yeah. Hogwarts below in like the depths in like a secret place one-on-one one-on-one something magical and unexplainable happens
the last last time it was the philosopher's stone in his pocket this time he gets the gryffindor sword and the hat and the phoenix and the phoenix um somebody who's not who they say they are with yeah. the teacher last time being a pawn of voldemort. voldemort this time this was voldemort in disguise almost um the bathroom is a focal point last movie they had to face the, the troll. troll this time they had moaning myrtle who gave them the clues they needed to access the chamber of secrets um so like we're saying it's it's basically a very similar film um and so it's it's hard to distinguish between the two like give me a year or two and i'm uh, these movies are gonna blend together i promise you but they came out a year apart so that's the thing is like did people realize i was like this is very similar to the first movie that came out (laughs) oh i also wrote down it's always voldemort he's always the problem it's not like a different problem or villain or anything it's always voldemort okay and then moving on so what did you think about okay so the first film when we watched it the cgi was very obvious and very bad bad it was very bad crusty and like it it took away from the movie it was very uh playstation 2 slash clone uh, the attack of the clones bad this film they used a lot more practical effects i felt like like i aragog was practical and then the some ballast the spiders, was, some of the other spiders were yeah and ballast the ballast was was a puppet like a like an animatronic i could tell in some shots it was really there um and then they did use uh so there was another quidditch scene and they did use cgi felt like it was better than last time oh yeah there was a couple moments that looked a little rough but there it was it was well made so it looks my guess is that they heard a couple criticisms they're like we gotta we gotta fine tune this we got a nicer budget this time so we gotta uh tune this up but it, it, if because it was better and the fight scenes looked better. It, it didn't break immersion as much. Did you have any moments you were like, okay, okay, I see you, movie. I see you, good decision on here. So when they're in the car in the forest and they're trying to get away from, get away from the spiders and there's that momentary jump scare where one of the spiders hits the window and that's like, oh, that's a real practical spider. Well, obviously not a living spider, but this is a puppet or a, a, a piece of prop. But... It's nice that it's a real thing. It's a physical thing, and it makes it feel a little bit more real, a little bit more immersive, and and so that was helpful. Uh, I pointed out it's funny because like they want you to believe they're surrounded by thousands of spiders, but the dog that they're with, Fang, has zero reaction because a dog in that scenario would be barking, would be attacking, would be freaking out. Because there were no real spiders, the dog is just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah, unbothered. Because, oh, well, yeah, I guess I guess the way they would explain that is that it's Hagrid's dog. And so he like, this is just a normal day for him. Like he sees this all the time. But like, I don't know. I've met many dogs who do the same thing every day and they bark at the same thing every time they see it. So maybe Fang's just super chill. But yeah, like in reality, that dog's just like, I'm good. I'm here. I've been told to sit here and I'm going to do that and everything's great. Um, and then and the Harry and Ron are like, oh and he's just like why are y'all screaming you know it's like there's nothing there okay so that part okay back to the flying car part this flying car is enchanted and it, the weasleys own it and ron and harry ha- the, okay so originally uh the twins ron's brothers pick up harry in this car and they go and take him to his house and then they are try to go to hogwarts via the train for some reason we find out later this is dobby's doing but for some reason they can't go through the platform nine and three quarters and so they're like well what do we do how do we get there and he's like let's just drive there in the enchanted car and they actually do it so this proves that our theory that the only way to get to hogwarts through is through the train is false but it leaves a lot of questions to be asked mainly if a plane flies by will it see hogwarts if you know where is it located right you know is it is it veiled at all because why would the car be able to get to it you know um if somebody accidentally was like wandering in the forest and they got lost could they accidentally turn the corner and see hogwarts you know is there you know any kind of semblance of this can't get there that can't get there because it's hidden in like a hidden area but like the car could just get there pretty easily yeah they just drive there well fly they fly there in the car they drive there so uh, they're like we thought that maybe the reason why they did the train was that like that was an enchanted thing like that was the only way you could get to hogwarts for safety reasons that's not true you can just fly there on a broomstick in a car they get uh beat up by a tree that's supposedly sentient they get to Hogwarts. So many convenient things are sentient when they need it to be. They get to Hogwarts, and as soon as they get to Hogwarts, the car throws them out of the car with their luggage and just drives off. So this is now 
oh, we know the car is sentient in some way, shape, or form. Like, it is like, I'm out of here. I'm done. Also, it can sense when they're in danger. Yes, because it somehow, when they're with Aragog, they're like, how are we going to get out of this? The car shows up. And I'm like... It herbies the situation. Yes. I was like, why is the car here? Why would it know they're in trouble? Where was it? Was it just in the woods this whole time? Like, just chilling and it heard their cries or something? But it somehow is sentient came to them rescued them i think at one point it comes again or maybe i'm wrong but yeah. i don't know it, it just it it's starting to become a uh, su- series of convenient events with this movie because things are sentient and things are helpful when they need to be and they aren't when they aren't like the phoenix there's no way that phoenix should have not only been able to get there to carry in this underground chamber but also what do you mean it could sense that it, he believed so strongly in Dumbledore that he sensed it and it came to his aid and knew to bring the hat and knew that the hat was going to give him everything he needs? You know, it, it's it's like, okay, there was no explanation earlier that, that the bird was going to be able to be like all wise. Yeah, they explain so the bird does two things after the fight. It cries on Harry's wound because it Dumbledore says its tears have healing powers, and then he also says that they can carry like a lot of weight. And he carries, he flies all of the people who are trapped down there up back into Hogwarts. He says nothing about the Phoenix being able to be summoned by loyalty or anything like that. But it's also, just, if he is, if the bird is able to get down there, that means. Dumbledore probably has a passage to the Chamber of Secrets in his room. I don't... How did he find out how to get down there? Is it like... how? Like, can he... Okay, this movie was definitely not meant for our age group. I mean, the only, the only way I can think of is that the bird like had the sense, the, th- the sixth sense or whatever, and the passageway in the bathroom was still open, and then it went there and flew down and went to them. Maybe. But even then, the bird knew to go from Dumbledore's office down the secret passages of that all the way through the school to the bathroom down that passage down the rubble from the 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 passage being destroyed then enough to find harry yeah and then that kind of leads into this other point Mm -hmm. what are the rules of the magic because you asked me when we were watching this what time period is this in i said it's the 90s i know that it like the first book takes place in like 98 or something like that or 97 so it's it's the 90s in the muggle world and in the wizarding world also and they have this whole thing where like who who wrote this on the wall who petrified the cat who did this i'm like do you guys have security cameras do you have magical security and where you can just like or you have paintings on the wall you can talk to can you just ask them what they saw and also at this point are we not if we've been dealing with Voldemort for however long they've been dealing with Voldemort which sounds like a while probably more than 50 years at At least 50 years are they not wise enough to be like hmm maybe it's Voldemort or better yet if there's this okay if the school's been around for a thousand years Meaning that the school's been producing wizards for a thousand years, graduating classes, just like a regular school, they, you know, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade. That means there are plenty of wizards out in the world that could be like, hey, we send an owl. Hey, Voldemort's out there. Let's band a team together and go get him because he's harassing children in a castle. Can we get him? Or heaven forbid, get the teachers to put like, can, is there like a cloaking spell? Or is there like a, a shield spell we could put over the school? Or, or you know, something we could put over the students? Why is that not a spell we could do? Why is it we're so focused on, you know, the mandrakes? We have to have a scene where the students have to do the mandrakes. Okay, I, I want to talk about that because this deals with the stupid rules of the magic okay we're in the 90s this school has been around for a thousand years they've been perfecting their magic the potions the spells for a thousand years and we have students for nine months ten months out of the out of a year that are petrified that are frozen in time or worse and we have a scene at the beginning of the film where they take these mandrakes these plants that are sentient again and they have to the students have to do something with them and they have to wait for a full growth cycle before the mandrakes can be used to create a potion to heal the students can't they outsource that stuff can't they like put a spell on it to fully grow it to completion or you know get one from another place because these are students these are children that are in danger for their lives. Yeah, I just thought about that. Like, why can't they just find fully grown mandrakes someplace else and buy them? I mean, Diagon Alley should have some, right? Yeah, or maybe even the potion that they're looking for. Yeah, I don't, I just, it doesn't make sense. And also, why is it like, it feels like sometimes the magic just doesn't do what it could. Like, what are the limits to it? Is it just only the spells that exist in the world and that's it? Can, you know, new spells be created? Can, 
old spells be outsourced or um, kicked out. There's there's no like lore that they really go into. Like here are the rules for our magic. Here's what it can't do. Here's what it can do. Because your favorite one, what is the, the spell they do to access Dumbledore's passage? Yeah, <laughs> McGonagall takes Harry and he's she's like, yeah, talk to Dumbledore. And there's this spiral staircase that's like hidden or something. I think it's like a eagle and he yeah. like stands in it. So before, before she says this, keep in mind, everyone who's listening to this, any other spells that are cast are somewhat close to Latin or or our Latin words that are like expelliamos or you know something like that and it's like this fancy thing and it sounds like something that's to be memorized what is the spell to access Dumbledore's lair it's like it's like lemon sherbet or lemon sorbet which I'm like is that like a password it's like you know when you make a password for your computer and she's like oh I'll just make this up and this is the thing or is it like a spell that they made with their own words to get the thing to work and I'm like so can they make their own spells with their own words why are you having this like like ridiculous sounding little command lemon sorbet. I mean, it's cute, but like lemon sherbet, 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 sorbet. I don't know. It's just to like get into Dumbledore's office, but you don't have like a security system. And more importantly, what are the qualifications for these teachers? Because first off, did no one realize that this one guy, Lockhart, was a fraud and a sham? But also, why does it seem like anytime there's an incident at this school, Snape, McGonagall, Dumbledore are just like shrugging their shoulders and are perplexed as ever to figure out how to fix this. And yet they're supposed to be the professors of their classes. They're supposed to be the experts in their field. And they are, and and these students are outsmarting them. It doesn't make really any sense why the students are five steps ahead of these teachers, unless this is all, and this might be just a theory, this is all like a test to perfect the students is that these are all like Voldemort is not really a threat. It's just to make these the best wizards they can. I don't know, it's very traumatizing for them. But that goes into what we were talking about with the message of the film. A big theme in these two films, I don't know if it's going to keep going, is one, authority and people people who are in power or an authority figure, such as like teachers, older people, adults, can't be trusted. They are not equipped. They are not competent. Can't trust them. Not only can't trust them, they, they're they not even like reliable as sources of influence. Yeah. Like they're, you know, their advice is weak and their threats against you is meaningless. Uh, they don't take like the the situation either seriously enough or they don't take it seriously enough quickly enough they're just like oh i mean it's fine (laughs) okay perfect example of this so ron and harry steal a car they drive the car from london to hogwarts they're seen they're seen by real people which uh, that's another question of how that's even not a thing more often they drive to hogwarts they crash the car into a sentient tree and they slam the, the car slams down and destroys school property. The punishment is detention with the fake teacher to sign autographs. That is the punishment for doing something that would actually qualify as a felony. And it, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. There's, if this is supposed to be this prestigious school for a thousand years, there's no real rules. Yeah, and then I also have ra- written down breaking rules and not communicating helpful information slash almost lying and not trusting authority figures gets rewarded in the films. So Dumbledore is the king of this so far. <laughs> yes, he loves he, it. He loves ha- it when they break the rules. Harry's he, Harry having a conversation with him and Dumbledore's like, do you have anything else to say to me? And, Dumb- and he's like, no. And like, you have so much to say to him. You have so much helpful information. And why did you say no? Like, it doesn't make sense. You, you went through the last movie. You barely survived the last movie and you were like 15 maybe younger and you get to the next movie why is not the first thing because you realize you can trust certain teachers why would you not go to mcgonagall and like hey i'm hearing voices in my head that sound creepy um i'm not responsible for them i don't know what's going on and this creature came into my house in london and he's magical and he threatened to hurt me if i came here and that my life was on the line if i came here why would you not say this to a teacher you knew was reliable from the last movie yeah because the first thing before the voices was like hey i'm being harassed by this house elf and mcgonagall or dumbledore or probably would know that Dobby was the Malfoy's house elf, which would immediately tip them off that something's going on. And they would probably not let the the Malfoys know they know this information. I think maybe Harry was afraid that his masters, whoever they were, would hurt him or kill him if he revealed that information. But McGonagall or Dumbledore wouldn't let that happen. They would probably try to protect him too, but it would at least tip them off like, oh, something's going on with the Malfoys because Dobby, their house elf, is trying to keep Harry Potter from coming to school. But once again, every time the... the <laughs> 
something bad happens the teachers look over at team potter and they're like did you do anything and they're like no we don't know anything at all and they're like oh well and then you get to the end of the movie and it's like dumbledore's like wink wink i knew i could trust you you did a good job breaking all those rules 200 points to gryffindor but he's like so you broke all these rules and this should get you expelled but actually it's going to get you commended and it's going to get you rewarded i'm like then what's the point of having the rules if breaking them makes it good for you and i get that sometimes rules have to be broken but you have to do that in a way where the people who are watching like the kids who are watching as a kid's movie they have to understand like the law above law which is like we break the rules <laughs> you have to go apologetics to this where do we get this the law above the law but we break man's rules when they go against god's law because god outranks man and so like like if if suddenly like, like if so let's say the rule is jaywalking and that's against the rule but if you saw somebody in the middle of the street who was let's say an elderly lady who couldn't get across and a car was about to hit her you can break the jaywalking rule because the greater law from god is to protect the sanctity of life and so pushing her out of the way to save her yes you are jaywalking but you're saving a life and that honors god and if right. even if you get a ticket for jaywalking for some bizarre reason you are honoring a greater law yeah that's a very simple example but you can apply that to many different situations and that's happened like that's happened in many situations around the world where um you know being a christian and even other countries where your religion isn't legal you know people will stand up for what they believe in and stuff and i get that's what she's trying to do she's trying to be like it's so it, you should stand up for what you believe in but it's like all they could have done that and told it and told and have worked with the teachers because you've already established that at least two of these teachers are trustworthy or Hagrid too three authority figures are trustworthy and have the best intentions for the students and they just don't go to them well they'll go to Hagrid but they won't tell him everything and they'll and they'll give him little pieces and he'll ac he'll, he'll accidentally give them information and then the movie the movie progresses and so it's 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 illogical and it's very much convenient and, and I'm trying not to hate on the movie I, it's beautiful <laughs> it's it's well shot and it's it's whimsical but coherent it is not concise it is not logical it is not yeah we talked about this um already about the it has a deus ex machina again at the end with the phoenix um and harry's loyalty giving him the gryffindor sword and then stabbing the diary which i guess i, I understand destroying the diary at that point the thing that really bothered me about that sequence was the surprise it was Ginny the whole time that was not established at all in the movie beforehand was that told to us at all like hinted to us that it would have been her it was it was never told to us she was acting weird or that she was gone a lot. We didn't see her. She barely had any lines of dialogue after the Diagon Alley scene. Yeah, uh, that one part where they were like, oh, we're so happy you got into Gryffindor House. But she, supposedly it's like, oh yeah, Ginny was the one. She was in a trance the whole time and all this stuff. And I'm like, we never saw any hints of her being weird at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like for a film language, they would have to like try to be like, hey, Ginny's acting odd. It was just thrown at us. I mean, maybe it was supposed to be a surprise, like a, a twist, but... It felt not like a twist, but more like a sloppy, like bad writing. Like if you were going over it, they'd be like, hey, you should hint about this. You should foreshadow this a little bit instead of just like putting it at the end. Like it would have been made more sense if it was like Ginny was suspicious or she saw something she shouldn't have seen, like the Tom Riddle thing or whatever. She saw something she shouldn't have seen. And so she was either petrified or brainwashed to work for the situation so like she was wandering the halls after class and saw something that and she was going to report it and we we you know took care of her or whatever instead it's like she was just the tool the whole time and yeah well they do make the point that he the reason why she got the diary is because lucius snuck it into her thing at that part in the diagon alley but they don't show her like acting weird or reading it or anything like that and if they did i missed it but there's nothing to read it's a blank diary that you have to write in to get answers with. I just thought of another thing. So the the monster in this one is the Balisk. Is how you say it? Basilisk. The Basilisk. There's a big serpent that when you look in its eyes, it kills you. But conveniently, everyone, except Moaning Myrtle back in the 50s, everyone looked at the reflection of it somehow and uh, or through a camera or something and got petrified and not killed. Did you notice that? That everyone, there was like what, like a couple people, mm -hmm. but everyone just happened to uh, see the reflection of it and not the actual gaze. And so no one died. I thought it was like, and that's then, kind of... Yeah. And then the... Um the phoenix knew to stab out its eyes so that harry wouldn't have to worry about that right so it would just be even more convenient so that was no longer a threat to harry so they could easily have harry look the snake in the eye and um so what do we think about like the pacing of the film um 
I think you said you like the action sequences better in this movie. Well, it, the pacing was better because it was just instead of like exposition, 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 it was like we were kind of already established. We know what we know what uh, Quidditch is. We know what the classes are. We know how the school works. So we can just move on to the story. And so that helps it. So it was it was it kept my attention, even though it was nearly three hours long. It kept my attention um, and the action sequences because it wasn't bad CGI. It was a little more engaging. I, I still think there's some things that weren't explained very well, but pacing wise, it, it felt it flowed a lot better and the story beats connected a lot better and it didn't feel very preachy. <laughs> as much as it was show the story a little bit better. I liked, I actually did like them escaping Aragog, like the, the, so not the whole sentient car thing, but like the, um, the feeling and the, the, I'm trying to find a word that kind of goes along with the action. The stakes felt really high. And when they were trying to escape the, the spiders, cause there's so many of them mm-hmm. and it was actually really fun and engaging. Um, the Quidditch match I felt like was fun and engaging. Um, I think I think the Quidditch match was shorter than it was in the other movie, which I think was a good choice. Well, the other movie had like three or four scenes with the Quidditch match. This right. one had one and a half. Right. Um, and then, I don't know, I, th- I feel like the final fight with the Ballis, Bal- Bal- Basilisk, Basilisk, Basilisk the big snake, <sighs> it was okay. It like, what, like it, I don't know. I like that they use the animatronic for it with the practical effects, but I don't know. It just didn't feel that, that climactic at that point in the movie for some reason. I don't know if you agree or not, but... Yeah. I, I, I just felt like the for all the hype with the snake and with all the build up to it, it was you know nobody got turned to stone or nobody died because of the snake. Um, and I mean, it took a couple, it took two swings of a sword and snake was dead. I'm like, okay, well then, if a boy who is you know 16 who has zero sword skills can know how to kill this thing, then then what kind of threat is it? I mean, I don't know. Two things I wanted to mention before we close up. There's just two little two little nuggets. Hermione <laughs> Hermione turns into a cat girl, but not in the way you think <laughs> in this movie. Um, they're making this thing called Polyjuice Potion. Which was a complete waste of time. This whole this whole arc was a waste. Mm-hmm. And they need the hair of the people they're going to turn into. And so Harry and Ron turn into Crab and Goyle, which are like Malfoy's goons. And they're trying to get information. And um, Hermione gets like a hair off of this cloak from a Slytherin girl. She's like, I'll turn into her. And then she's like in the bathroom. She's like, you guys go ahead. I'm not going to go. And they're like, OK. And then they come back and she's like, I don't want to come out. And then they open it. Like, you know, that sound that's like, I whoop, jump scare. Literally, it was very scary. I went, oh, very similar, ironically, weirdly to how how the Cats movie was animated. When did that movie come out? 2020 or 2021? I think it was 2020. But like the CGI quality of this one from 2002 to that movie, it was very, it felt very similar. The Uncanny Valley was still there. I don't know how you felt about the reveal of that. I didn't feel like it was as frightening as much as it was. It was one of those moments it was like meant for laughs and it was just like, this is already a long movie. This is already almost three hours. (laughs) Do we really need this? Do I really need to see somebody turn into a cat person? Which also does not make sense because they both, all three took the potion at the same time, which means they all should, all three should have turned into their person at the same time, which means they all should have been detransforming at the same time because we saw that with Ron and Harry that they transformed at the same time, they detransformed at the same time. So it should have been when they got to her, she was back to being Hermione instead of the cat girl. They kept it for laughs rather than making any sense of it. Also to be clear, so the reason why she turned to a cat is because the hair she took off that girl's cloak was cat hair from her pet cat, the girl's pet cat, not from her head. So that's why that happened. Um, And then second one was at the very end, Lucius, 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 or I'm just calling him Lucius, comes in and he's having this really dramatic like back and forth with Dumbledore and Harry Potter. And then he just steps into this like 1940s femme fatale lighting where just his eyes are, you know, like in the Addams Family, the one from the 90s, they always light Morticia, the one played by Angelica Houston, they always light her that way in that movie, has that bar of like bright light all across his eyes. And it's like just heckin' camp the whole time. It is like he is there. He is melodramatic. He is the villain. He has the cape. I liked it. I thought it was funny and good in like in that, in that nice campy way. But the movie, like we were talking about, takes it seriously in a way that where it kind of feels totally off. So like the whole movie, anytime he's in a scene, it's like it's obviously building up this threat from him. He is... You know, looking down on the children. He's looking down on the school. He comes in and arrests Hagrid, and he's like snubbing his nose at Dumbledore. And you're like, oh, this guy is 
powerful and strong and a threat and you don't know how powerful he is but you know he's strong enough to be able to walk into a room of Dumbledore and be semi-threatening and be and you know and not be scared of him but then you get to the scene and he's like I'm, I'm waiting for he's like you've met your match he man and then you're like I'm waiting <laughs> yeah. for like I'm waiting for like a Skeletor thing because it's goofy it's 80s like goofy movie villain um, I'm waiting for like the moral of the story is to be a good friend to your buddies like it, there's he he goes from the threat to the joke in about two seconds because all they have to do is mess with the lighting and give him some quirky things to say and now all that build up is kind of degraded yeah i'm okay with lucius being a little bit fabulous i love it i think it's great i think it, it's great for his character i love jason isaac's take on that I, it makes him interesting it makes him like fun to watch it makes it like wow you know i like that this is he's a uh, racist bigot <laughs> and he's a real threat but by goodness he's gonna whip that cape around and have his long blonde hair and his lighting um it's just that tonally because for so long the movies were, were really taking this as like a serious very like whimsical like kids show and then at the end with this lighting and with this character it felt like they were going into that camp and i'm like i would like more of this it just needs to be evenly spread throughout the the films now i know as we go longer as i said it's just gonna get darker and darker and grittier i don't know how this version of lucius is going to survive in those later movies if we're gonna see him this way but yeah i just noticed and like that when he walked away with and he's like oh here's your diary he's like you think this is my diary and he's like the way that they just had that like interaction he was so melodramatic he was so over the top and theatrical but like in a way that i loved and i was like ah this is great but at the same time like this just compared to like how every other actor is oh the only other the only other actor that is like this with their character is alan rickman as snape in a different way though (laughs) like there's a part of this movie or have they're having the duel the defense against the dark arts duel with malfoy and um draco malfoy and harry potter and snape like turns on like a dime and he's like he whips around his hair like whips around i'm like alan rickman is just he's going with it with this character he loves his wig he loves his costume and he is like i know what to do with this character so i I said that when we were watching i love how alan rickman plays snape it is so iconic uh and with jason isaac says lucius malfoy too iconic slytherins you have anything else to add no i am i'm curious to see where the story goes even though it's been out for so long that people have already spoiled it for me on the internet so i don't really have any like too many shocks that are going to come to me from this but you know we've got six movies to go i'm sure it's going to go somewhere hopefully um yeah even though there's rumored that there will be a ninth movie eventually they made okay so they made this uh play someone made a play called the cursed child i don't know if this is what's coming out all i know is that it was it was like a story that was made into a play it was about harry potter's kids and jk rowling like canonized it and people hate it. I don't know if that's the movie that's coming out or not, but I I've know heard that rumors. That, I mean, yeah. I know that the the Fantastic Beasts is pretty much done. Um, so I would not be surprised if she goes for one last cash grab. Well, not a lot of people like her right now. So what if she does a Stephanie Meyer and does the story of Harry Potter from Voldemort's perspective? Honestly, genius marketing. Not even marketing. Just genius. Like, like you. Just, she Stephanie Meyer has sold the same story three different times, <laughs> and she is making bank on it, and it's great. And I eat it up every time. So, you know what? I bet the Potterheads would totally take that. They would totally want to see it from the villain's point of view, from Voldemort's point of view. Um, even like we said, even but like we said means, with, huh? But that assumes that I think Edward is the villain of Twilight. But that's people fine. argue that. But we say this with Twilight too. When we were last having you watch Twilight, you were like, all these characters with this history and backstory, I just want to know more about them. And there are the same thing with Harry Potter. There's so much backstory. She could just write books that are like prequels to the story. Um, so supposedly that, that website Pottermore has a bunch of that info on it and like you can learn all about that stuff but I'm like I don't know you have to pay you have to pay a subscription to have Pottermore but then you get your real sorted into your real house and you know all about that stuff you get your wand I don't know what you get but supposedly it's like you get your real personality test when you get the subscription you get a membership to the BK Kids Club <laughs> I know um, so I think we have to wrap up we are coming in right in about an hour which is a great time for us do you think you want to be a wizard you want to be a wizard Will no unless it's a space wizard space wizard. do you know what i'm referencing no jedi are called space wizards oh really i did not know that okay well i think that'll wrap it up for us the next time we see you we'll be going over harry potter 3 the prisoner of azkaban and i'm hannah i may be will (laughs) maybe he'll be here maybe not but thank you for uh coming in and listening with us and going on this harry potter journey with us and this is two christians watch and uh we'll see you later bye bye